Hello. In this lecture, we'll go over how to prove trigonometric identities. So we begin with basic identities, reciprocal and Pythagorean identities that we already know. Then we'll go over strategies for how one proves new trigonometric identities using these ones we already have and work through several examples. Now an identity, remember, is an equation that is always true. For example, 2 times x minus 1 equals 2x minus 2 is always true. It is an identity. However, 2 times the quantity x minus 1 equals 0 is sometimes true, but sometimes not. It is an equation that you could solve for x. This is true, but it is not always true. It was not called an identity. Now, there are many identities which involve trigonometric functions. For example, sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is always equal to 1. This is called the Pythagorean identity. Now, in this lecture, we'll go over how to prove or derive new identities from known ones. In the previous lecture, we saw how certain identities could be used to compute things. That is not the focus here. So how do we prove new identities? Now, there's a number of identities that we already know. These are what we will call the basic identities. For example, the tangent of theta is sine theta over cos theta. That's always true because it's the definition of tangent. Similarly, cotan theta is cos theta over sine theta, secant theta is 1 over cos theta, and cosecant theta is 1 over sine theta. Also, we have the Pythagorean identity, sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1. We can divide everything by cos squared theta to get the similar Pythagorean identity, tan squared theta plus 1 equals secant squared theta, or having begun with the Pythagorean identity and divided by sine squared theta, 1 plus cotan squared theta equals cosecant squared theta. Now, to prove a new identity means not just to establish it's true for some values. It is not enough to simply pick a given value of theta and check that it is true. You need to show that it is true for all values of theta. So you need to show that the given equation is always true no matter what value someone picked for your angle. Now, synonyms for prove in mathematics are establish, verify, show. There are probably other ones, but these are the most common. These all mean the same thing. Use allowable steps in order to prove, establish, verify, or show that the given identity is always true no matter what. For example, let's prove the identity that secant x plus tangent x times secant x minus tangent x is always equal to 1. Now we will expand the left-hand side and use a Pythagorean identity. So let's multiply out that entire left-hand side. You get secant squared x minus secant x tangent x plus tangent x secant x minus tangent squared of x. Those middle terms cancel. We have a minus secant x tangent x plus tangent x secant x. Those cancel each other out and we have secant squared x minus tangent squared x. Now we'll use a Pythagorean identity that secant squared x is always the same thing as tangent squared x plus 1. And now our tangent squareds cancel and we simply have a 1. Observe that we did not plug any value in for x. Using known identities and algebraic steps, we showed that secant x plus tangent x times secant x minus tangent x is always equal to 1 no matter what. Let's do another example. Actually, we're going to do the same example a different way. Usually, there are many different ways that an identity could be established. So here's a different way to derive exactly the same thing as the previous example. So we're going to write everything in terms of sines and cosines. So the secant x plus tangent x times secant x minus tangent x, well, secant x I replace with 1 over cosine x, and tangent x I replace with sine x over cosine x. Observe that inside the parentheses, both terms have a common denominator of cosine. So give them that common denominator. Our first term becomes 1 plus sine x over cos x, and our second term becomes 1 minus sine x over cos x. Now I can multiply these two fractions together. Our numerator is 1 plus sine x times 1 minus sine x, and our denominator is cosine squared x. That numerator expands as 1 minus sine squared x. It's a difference of 2 squared factoring. But our denominator of cosine squared x, thanks to the Pythagorean identity, can be replaced with 1 minus sine squared x. And now we have 1 minus sine squared x over the same thing, 1 minus sine squared x, and that's just 1. So a different, just as correct derivation of the same identity. Usually, a given trigonometric identity can be derived in a great many ways, all of which could be correct. Now here's some general advice when you are trying to establish a trigonometric identity. There's basically two ways to do it. 
turn the left hand side into the right hand side. In other words, start with the left hand side, perform some steps on it, and eventually, with a little bit of luck, have exactly the right hand side. Alternately, you can do the opposite. Start with the right hand side and begin to manipulate it, and eventually, with a little luck, end up with exactly the left hand side. You shouldn't be working on both sides at the same time. If you are manipulating both sides of the expression, you're implicitly assuming that they're already equal. If you start off by writing left hand side equals right hand side and start manipulating that, you've already assumed the two things are equal and that's exactly what you are trying to prove is true. So you should not start off by stating that it is true. It's a good idea to start with whichever side is more complicated and manipulate it to look like the less complicated side. This isn't a rule or anything, it's just a rule of thumb. It's generally easier to take something nasty and make it nicer, rather than to start with something relatively simple and somehow arbitrarily make it more complicated. There are a few ways to take an ugly thing and make it look simple, whereas there are a great many ways to take a simple thing and make it look ugly. And it's easier to do the work if you have fewer options to choose from. So usually it's a good idea to pick the side that looks worse as your starting point and try to turn it into the side that looks simpler. Now, if you do get stuck, always remember that your tangents, your cotangents, and all of that can always be replaced with sines and cosines. This can also be used to cut down how many choices you have. If every problem can be restated as just about sines and cosines, it may be easier to figure out some missing steps. Also, the Pythagorean identities are going to come into play a lot. Sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1, but in that form it doesn't always show up. Instead, a sine squared theta might pop up by itself, but that could be replaced with a 1 minus cos squared theta, or similarly a cos squared theta could be replaced with a 1 minus sine squared theta. These are just things to bear in mind and try to remember as you're working through these problems. So here's an example. Let's prove that the cosecant of theta is cotangent theta over cosine of theta. I think the right-hand side looks more complicated. It has two different trigonometric functions and there's a fraction involved, so I'm going to start with that. So let's start with the right-hand side. Now I'm going to place everything in terms of cosines and sines. That cotangent is cosine theta over sine of theta. This is always true. All we've done is replace the numerator, cotan theta, with its equivalent form in terms of cosines and sines. Now we just do a little bit of algebra. Cosine theta over sine theta, all divided by cos theta, is the same thing as cos theta over sine theta times 1 over cos theta. This makes it a little easier to see that you have a cosine theta over a cosine theta that can be cancelled out, leaving 1 over sine theta, and what is 1 over sine theta better known as? Cosecant theta. So we started with our right-hand side, and we performed legal algebraic steps and made it turn into exactly the left-hand side. These two things are always equal. Let's see another example where replacing everything in terms of sines and cosines is productive. Let's show that the cosine of theta times tan theta plus cotan theta is always equal to cosecant theta. Well, now I'm going to start with the left. The left is definitely more complicated than the right. So starting with cosine theta times tan theta plus cotan theta, let's just replace tangent theta with sine theta over cos theta and cotangent theta with cosine theta over sine theta. All we've done is replace the tangent and cotangent with their equivalent forms in sines and cosines. Now I'm going to distribute that cosine theta across the two terms. Cosine theta times sine theta over cos theta, the cosines will cancel, leaving behind just the sine. But in our second term, we have a cos squared theta over sine theta. Now I want to give a common denominator to these two terms, so I'll call it sine squared theta over sine theta plus cos squared theta over sine theta. Since we have a common denominator, we can now add the numerators together. But look at that numerator, sine squared theta plus cos squared theta, basic Pythagorean identity, that's 1. And 1 over sine theta is cosecant theta. So starting with the left-hand side and performing a sequence of steps, we got exactly the right-hand side. Here's another example. Let's verify, in other words, show or prove, that secant of u minus tangent of u is equal to cosine u over 1 plus sine u. Now, picking which of these two sides is more complicated is a bit of a wash. On the right, we have a fraction. On the left, we've got secants and tangents rather than sines and cosines. We're going to start with the left-hand side, but we're going to do a little twist in the middle. You'll see what happens. 
So starting with the left-hand side, secant u minus tangent of u. I'm just going to replace everything to be in terms of sine and cosine. This is a generically useful thing to do in these sorts of proofs. So secant of u is 1 over cosine u, and tangent of u is sine u over cos u. Hey, we've got a common denominator of cosine, so I can combine this into a single fraction, 1 minus sine u over cos u. But observe that we know we want to change this into the right-hand side at top. And that the right-hand side has a denominator of 1 plus sine u. We currently have a denominator of cosine u. To get the denominator to have a 1 plus sine u in it, we're going to multiply the entire expression by 1 plus sine u over 1 plus sine u. Now this thing we have on the right, 1 minus sine u over cosine u, I can multiply it by 1 without changing the value. There is no other number you can multiply by that never changes the value. I can multiply by 1, but there are a lot of ways to write the number 1. I could write 1 as 7 over 7. I could write 1 as 1 plus x over 1 plus x. Here we're writing it as 1 plus sine u over 1 plus sine u. So taking that term 1 minus sine u over cos u and multiplying by a fancy and complicated way of writing the number 1, we're multiplying by 1 plus sine u over 1 plus sine u. This will not change the value of the right-hand side, but it will introduce into the denominator a 1 plus sine u, which we know we want. When I say we know we want it, we started with the left, and we're trying to make it look like this on the right, and this has a denominator of 1 plus sine u. It is going to be there now with some other stuff, but we'll worry about that later. We introduced a 1 plus sine u into the denominator because we know we wanted it, but you can't just put it there for free, but the way you get it into the denominator is to also multiply the numerator by the same thing. Now we can distribute up in the numerator. 1 minus sine u times 1 plus sine u is 1 minus sine squared u. It's a difference of 2 squared factoring. But Pythagorean identity time, 1 minus sine squared u is the same thing as cos squared u. And now observe that our numerator has a cos squared u and our denominator has a cosine u factored out. Those can be canceled, leaving behind cos u in the numerator and 1 plus sine u in the denominator, which is exactly what we wanted to achieve for our right-hand side. Let's do another identity. Prove that 1 plus sine theta over 1 minus sine theta is equal to the cosecant of theta plus 1 over the cosecant of theta minus 1. Now most of this proof is just going to be algebraic manipulation of fractions. Let's start with the right-hand side because cosecants are worse. So cosecant theta plus 1 over cosecant theta minus 1. I'm going to replace the cosecants with 1 over sine theta. Now I'm going to replace the 1s with sine theta over sine theta. Why would I possibly do this? Because now our numerator and denominator have common denominators of their own. So in our overall numerator, 1 over sine theta plus 1, to give it a common denominator, I replace 1 with sine theta over sine theta, and now I can combine these two fractions. Similarly, our overall denominator, I replace 1 with sine theta over sine theta, and now these can be combined, giving us 1 plus sine theta over sine theta over 1 minus sine theta over sine theta. Dividing one fraction by another is equivalent to multiplying by the reciprocal. So instead of dividing by this fraction, we multiply by its reciprocal, and now those signs can cancel each other out, leaving behind just 1 plus sine theta over 1 minus sine theta, which was our desired left-hand side. As always, there are many ways these proofs can be completed. So if you started this problem differently, it does not mean you were wrong. It just means you may have done the problem a different way. These trigonometric proofs in general can be proved many, many different ways. Each of these examples, we've only done one particular way, except for the first example we did at the very beginning explicitly to show that multiple proofs are possible.